Look at those smiles out there. People who love history. Yes, yes. I'm Diane and I'm the MC of the program and I love this. And you know, so many of the speakers that we've had here during our Chapin Library series, I have interviewed over the years. Um, sadly, I didn't know our celebrity that we're talking about today. Um, uh, I didn't move here until 84, and so she was before my time. But in the past couple of weeks, I've done some research on Helen, and what an extraordinary woman. And you'll see that in her extraordinary children. We're going to begin our program today with a little video, and then I'll introduce our speakers. So take a look. I think we need to really thank 
our speakers in advance for the dedication of going through those photos. You know it had to be poignant. I'm sure they laughed and cried, and that's what we hear from so many of our speakers who are here talking about their families. I'd like to present to you Helen, Helen's children. They are here, the family's here, and this, my friends, is Carolyn and Russ Mates, Helen's two children. Thank you. Greetings and salutations, everyone. We just want to say thank you so much to Chapin Library, to Martina Corley, to you, Diane, you. for doing such a great job all the time. Thank uh, you to my family. Oh, God. Sorry. <laughs> and to all our wonderful friends. And thank you for being here. It's truly an honor for us to stand here in front of you today. Uh, Carolyn. Where are you going? No. <laughs> You're not done yet. <laughs> okay, we, we were just curious. Who, who here remembers um, shopping in Helen Mate's store? You're lying. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay, I have one better. Who here still has a piece of clothing, anything that you may still have from the store? Up. My wife. I'm putting my hand up for my wife. There. Oh. oh, look. Yay. Yay, sis. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, sis. Okay, now you can go sit down. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Before I get too much farther, there he is. About 65 to 75 percent of the photographs that were in the video or that you'll see in today's presentation were taken by this gentleman, our very own Mr. Jack Thompson. Yay, Jack! Yay, Jack! The period of time that we're going to concentrate on the most is going to be the mid-century period, which most historians uh, put at about 1946, 47, right after the war, through 68 to 70. And what's interesting about that is our parent store was in operation exactly from 1947 to 1970. It did close in 1970. So um, now, as I think some of y'all went to the Ocean Forest event, and this was the time our parents used to also go and dance on the marine patio, hear the live bands. Um, I know that fundraising for the Myrtle Beach Hospital, the Ocean View Memorial Hospital, was big back then. So people would, uh, there would be fundraisers there, right, Jack? Yeah. And dances. And I had never heard of him before until we started doing this research. Unfortunately, I hadn't, but he's well known. Tex Beneke, who was, I think, one of Harry James' proteges, was uh, came and played for a fundraiser for the uh, for the Ocean View Memorial Hospital. Now, another thing that a lot of people, because a lot of uh, it only ran up until maybe the mid '50s, was the Myrtle Beach Playhouse, and that was considered one of the top seven summer stock theaters in the entire United States. And it was started by Jane Barry Haynes, who had been an actress, and then she was big with the Mayo Baba Center, I know, in, in later years. Um, now, for me personally, some of the places I remember when I was growing up, I mean, besides my school, I went to St. Andrews Catholic School, Myrtle Beach High School, go Seahawks, <laughs> of course. But um, I remember DeGeorge's Red and White. I can still picture Mr. DeGeorge. I don't know if any of y'all remember him with his little red tie on. Um, Max, 5 and 10, with we used to call him Mr. Jingles because Mr. Beecham would follow you kind of up and down the aisles on the creaky boards and jingle jangle. And then John's Barbecue, the drive-ins, Winks, um, Jeans, the Hickory House. And then downtown, of course, we had Divine Sporting Goods, j, j Drugs, Chapin Company, the Cozy Corner, and later the Ocean Surf Shop. 
uh, which my brother and I spent a lot of time in. <laughs> and um, also the Rivoli Theater. We loved Pirate Land. My first job was at Pirate Land. Fort Caroline. I mean, it was a great place to grow up in, in those years. Um, and then, of course, there was our store. And, you know, although our store was named after my mom, it was very common to name stores, especially retail clothing stores, because after a person, you had Joan Crosby, you had John Baldwin, you had, um, who else was it? Uh, John Baldwin. Um, What's the other, Joan Crosby, but there was, oh, Barry Sturmer's Men's Shop oh, and Nelson's Men's Shop. Yeah, so it was very common in those years to name a clothing store after a person. But make no mistake that my dad was the one who really ran that store every day, got up and got it open at 8.30, 9 o'clock every morning, six days a week. And on Sunday, he played golf <laughs> and gin rummy. <laughs> after golf. Um, so a lot of times people will say, your mother's store, your mother's store. And I understand it because that was what it was called. But it was really our parents' store. Um, it just went along with our mother's store because it was her name. And it was ladies' clothing, although it did not start as a ladies' clothing store. And we'll get to that in a minute. But. Um, First, what I want to do, if I can get this to work, is tell you how we ended up uh, in Myrtle Beach. I've heard some of these other, I've watched them online. I haven't been able to be here in Myrtle Beach for any of them, but I've watched a lot of the others. And it's amazing to me how so many people can trace their roots back here to the 1700s, 1800s. And we are second generation immigrants. So as far as Myrtle Beach is concerned, we can only go back to 1939, I think it is. These are my father's parents, John Mates on the left. Mates is not a real name. <laughs> Mates, he escaped religious persecution in Lithuania to come into the port of Boston. He stayed in Boston. My dad was a Yankee. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Yay for the Yankee. That's, his, that's my grandmother, Clara. And then we can go to the next slide. OK, now on my mother's side, the Lebanese side, the dark side, um, <laughs> this is my great grandfather, um, John McCool. Name was changed to Mac. Um, he brought, these were all of his children. There is no wife because he came over to scout America, got on a train because he had gotten connections in Marion, South Carolina. He got off on the wrong Marion. He got off the train in Marion, North Carolina. <laughs> this was about in 1910. He slept in the train station because he could not speak English, Arabic only. Um, so they found a Lebanese family in Marion, North Carolina to come in the middle of the night to communicate with them. And he thought, well, I'm in North Carolina. I'm just going to stay here. So he did go back over to Lebanon. And in the time he was gone, <laughs> his wife, Nassim, had gone up to sweep off their roof. And unfortunately, she fell off the roof and died. So um, this is my grandmother, Sophie. We have another Sophie here who she's named after. Also followed them to Myrtle Beach and opened Nora's cottages, B&B &B cottages, just south of the pavilion, 705 North Ocean Boulevard. And this is Aunt Nora next to her car. I can't remember what kind of car that is. Now, you notice there's no air conditioning, of course. 
these were all, it was all fans or ceiling fans. This is, these are my grandparents, Myron for Curry and Sophia for Curry, Mac for Curry. Next. Now, my grandfather, they lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he opened a restaurant called the Argonne Forest Restaurant in Charlotte on Tryon Street. And um, this is his picture in World War I. I mean, he was still learning English when he joined the army to fight in World War I. And then the Argonne Forest was the, basically the decisive battle in World War I that sort of heralded the end of the war. And he decided, he fought in that battle. And so um, he decided that he was going to name his restaurant the Argonne Forest. Um, so my mom, my mom graduated Central High School in 1939. And then they moved to the beach with my uncle Jack and my uncle Russell, who both graduated from Myrtle Beach High School. They were some of the earliest graduates of Myrtle Beach High School. Um, OK, so here, I'm sure you'll recognize this. This is the Broadway Theater. This became J&J Drugs. Right here, you can barely see it because it's a, a linen uh, postcard. But this was the Argonne Forest. Uh, restaurant. So you see that there was not a second story. It was just one story. It was built in the late mid to late 30s, like a lot of these buildings were. And um, my mom, she had a semester at Salem College, a semester at USC. But I think when the war broke out, she had to come home and she waitressed in the restaurant. But she loved a jitterbug. And this is Mr. John Harris of Myrtle Beach. I don't know if y'all remember him, but his daughter, someone told me that this was underneath, Jack, you may have told me that it was underneath the um, plate glass at Peach's Corner on the bar. They have all the old, yeah, downstairs, yeah, yeah. So um, this had been posted, maybe I posted it on Myrtle Beach History, and a lady on there said, that's my father, John Harris, because we didn't know who it was. My mom just had uh, John and me. And, OK, so my dad, my dad flew 50 missions. Um, he did his 50 missions on B-25s in North Africa and Italy. Obviously, he's in Egypt here. He was a navigator and a bombardier on the B-25s, and so then he, after the 50 missions, his next assignment was to be an instructor on navigating and being a bombardier, and they sent him to Charleston Air Force Base. So he's down in Charleston, and he, even at that young age, he starts getting the golf bug. <laughs> and I believe Pine Lakes may have been 1943, 44, Pine Lakes may have been the only, there might have been the Dunes Club starting, I'm not sure. But he would come up and play golf on the weekends. And um, what happened was he went downtown to, um, he went downtown to uh, have lunch. And he was in a restaurant that Caroline Carmichael, she was Caroline Johnson, I'm sure some of y'all remember Caroline. And Caroline, and who my sister is named after, actually, she and my mom were very good friends. But Caroline was younger. She looked older, but she was only about 15, 16 years old. And she was working behind the lunch counter at this cafe, and my dad was flirting with her. And she told this story about 10 years ago. We did another thing similar to this. And um, she said, uh, listen, fly boy, I'm too young for you, OK? But, <laughs> but, 
but I have someone in mind. So she ran over to the Argon, and my mom was busy doing whatever. She said, Helen, you have to come right now, right now. I got, there, there's a handsome fly boy I want you to meet. And that is how they met, and then eventually um, got married. They were married in November of 1945. This is them on their honeymoon in New York City. After he was in the service, and to, for about a year after you were born, right? For 1947, I think. And sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie! I'll hear about that later. <laughs> um, so what happened was, my dad. I'll never forget my dad telling me that. He was back in the hot kitchen, no air conditioning. It was in the middle of the summer. And my grandparents, the way they would make the tuna salad, the egg salad, they would just get in there with their hands. And he was back there with up to his elbows and tuna salad or egg salad. And my mother and he, my mother and he just looked at each other. And he said, uh-uh, this, this is not for me. <laughs> And so, um, now that, so they decided that they wanted to open a children's shop. So it was originally a children's shop, not a ladies' clothing store. My grandparents were like, yeah, that's OK, because we want to be closer to the action near the pavilion. So they, my granddad owned that building. It was actually in our family until about 2003. But um, so he moved. To, renamed the restaurant to the Two Minute Grill, and this was on 8th Avenue and Ocean Boulevard, just right next to the pavilion. So now we're talking the late 40s. Let me go to the, And this is what the building looked like then. Still no second floor. Uh, Stanley Jewelers, this became our shoe department eventually. I don't know how that all worked out. But this is when it was the children's shop. This is outside of it uh, when they were raising money for polio, which they still had to do back in those days. And then, of course, this is what we see for most of the time. In 1951, 52, they added the second story here. This is the grand opening, the ribbon cutting. That young lady is that young lady, <laughs> and my sister, Beth. This is the opening day. This case right there is still there. We didn't know that until the city started the um, plans for the Arts and Innovation District. And uh, someone, who was it, Carolyn, told us that that fixed your case. Oh, I think Troy. Troy, yeah, the architect. He said, it's still in there. I mean, we're talking years and years and years it's been in there, and it's still in there today. Yeah. All right, so this is dated Women's Wear Daily, May 1st, 53. Um, and the reason that this is kind of important is it really talks about how well, for being so young, how well that they were doing. It talks about how people here in Myrtle Beach had to depend on summer to make it through the winter. That's all listed here. Um, it says, a small shadow box display window at the right of the lobby entrance is set in redwood paneling. They talk about the flagstone. All of that is still there. It's still there today. OK, so my mom was chairman of the Myrtle Beach Chamber of Commerce. They actually had a float committee in those years. This float. Um, can you go one more? I think there's. All right. So this, this is the. Um, that's Mr. Layer, Dick Layer. That's Justin Plyer. That's Mayor Ernest Williams, my mom, and it's called plans laid for Miami invasion because at first it was only supposed to be entered into the Charlotte. What's the Thanksgiving carousel? Carousel parade in, in Charlotte. And it did so well there that 
they were invited to the Orange Bowl. Um, and uh, I just want to read this. If it sounds like if it sounds like we're bragging about our parents, well, we are a little. <laughs> um, as Mayor of Myrtle, dear Mrs. Mates, as Mayor of Myrtle Beach, it gives me great pleasure to offer heartfelt congratulations to you for the wonderful ideas and fine work on your part, which contributed in a great way to Myrtle Beach having the outstanding prize and winning float in the recent Cherry Blossom Festival Parade in Washington. So after the Orange Bowl, they tweaked it a little bit, and then it entered the Cherry Blossom uh, Parade. Um, in my opinion, this has been the most outstanding publicity and goodwill projects ever put on by the people of Myrtle Beach. Okay, so anybody who knows anything about the South knows that beauty pageants in the 50s, <laughs> 40s, 50s, and 60s were everything. It, um, I don't know how this came about, but she was named, her mom was named the fashion, now they call them stylists, then they called them fashion consultants, and she was appointed as the consultant to whoever won Miss South Carolina to get her on to go to Atlantic City to compete in Miss America. And here's um, Mr. Wilson Springs and Don Cavanaugh because it was um, sponsored by the JCs and they were leaders in the JCs. This cost 25 cents. This is the original program of the Miss South Carolina pageant. This is the year that Marion McKnight won, went on and won Miss America. Um, it's in pretty good shape, too. I'm gonna hold on to that. This is Martha Dean Chestnut, who was a local here for many, many years. Uh, this was the year prior. I'm a little out of order. This is this. I think my mom did this for two years. This is the year prior. She won Miss South Carolina. She was Miss Conway, Carolyn. She was Miss Conway. She went on to the Miss America pageant, placing in the top ten. Okay, I just showed you that. That's Marion McKnight. She and her husband Gary Conway, who used to be on the show in the 60s, Land of the Giants, if you guys remember that show. They have a winery. They're, they're both still with us, and they have a winery up in Paso Robles, California. So, and again, she, so my mom, it says coached for poise, wardrobe, et cetera. And the second year my mom did it, she went all the way and won Miss America. Okay, then the, the next thing, I was talking about the Myrtle Beach Playhouse being one of the top seven. And I think Dino has mentioned it before where he was taking room service orders up to Mrs. Barrymore and <laughs> Mrs. Barrymore wasn't dressed. <laughs> but um, our mom was the, again, the stylish, the st stylist, they called him fashion consultant. So she provided the wardrobe for the characters in the play. I mean, as long as it was in modern times. I don't think my mom had 1800s things lying around. <laughs> well, was that Western costume or anything? So um, Zazu Pitts, Robert Weber, uh, Tuesday Weld, Roddy McDowell, Veronica Lake, all of those people came, stayed at the Ocean Forest Hotel. And they would play the lead roles, and then local theater students in South Carolina would play the supporting roles. Now, I, this is a little out of order, but the reason is that it gives you an idea. We just found this three months ago. My mother never talked about it. She, when she was a junior in high school, she somehow r wrangled away, and she got an interview with the David O. Selznick office in New York City 
to audition for uh, Scarlett O'Hara. And yeah. but that's kind of tied into the other because I think she really enjoyed the theater because she at one time had wanted to be an actress. Um, and so with this to talk a little bit more about my mom's style and the day-to-day -day activities of the store. Um, I worked in there one day. It's kind of a funny story. <laughs> tell it, tell it. Carolyn was like, well, I don't know. Well, my mom, anybody who knew my mom knew my mom was, she had a big heart. She was, a, you know, she loved people. She was completely extroverted. I, I was always more shy. Carolyn's pretty extroverted. But she had some issues with what was going on towards the last couple of years in the store. And when I was 11, she woke my brother and I up on Easter Saturday morning. And I was 11. My brother was 13. My brother Walt. And she said, OK, get up. We're going to work in the store. And I said, why are we going to work in the store? And she said, well, I've let everybody go. <laughs> I said, you what? Come on, I let everybody go. Everybody's been fired. So and so was stealing from me. So and so was doing this. I, 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 I just, I, I want to start all over again. But until then, it's Easter weekend. It's busy. Get up. We don't know what to do. You don't, don't you worry about it. So, she went down there, opened the store. She said, "I'll be at the register." Um, she told my brother to man the villager shop upstairs and for me to be near the front door and, and, and work in the shoe department. So I was like, oh, OK, I'm all excited. So the first customers <laughs> that come in, the woman barely gets in. I go, hello, welcome to Helen Mates. Can I help you? And she goes, uh, can, can I get in the door for her? <laughs> so that's the only time. But Carolyn did work in there for many summers, and so I'm going to turn it over to her for that part of it. Great job, Ron. Thank you, sweetie. I got it. Changing of the guard. The youngins before the old ones, right? Go first. Um, speaking of, oh, is this on? Oh, yeah, OK. Um, Speaking of the Playhouse, as we were talking about it, I remember one time that Beth and I were allowed to go. I don't know if, if I, all the details are a little fuzzy. If Daddy took us, Mother took us, and put us in the audience and sit or what. But um, it was great to, to be in the actual Playhouse and to see the production. And when it was over, they would call Mother up on the stage and uh, thank her for everything she's done for with the clothing for the cast and everyone. And then she introduced my sister and I, and we had to stand and we're like, uh. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we stood up, and you know, it was really kind of neat to do that. In talking about the store, I did work there. And as in any job you have, there are good parts, mundane parts, and parts you just don't even want to do. So a lot of that was rehanging clothes, cleaning out the dressing rooms, <coughs> fo folding shirts, sweaters, whatever it might be, just to keep things neat. Um, and then I was assigned, at least during the summer, to the villager shop upstairs and also worked with the ladies that were part of the college board. So some of you may remember uh, Tina Baden, Mimi Jameson, uh, let's see here, Margaret, Martha Lewis, Melody McGovern, Susan McLaurin, and Joy uh, Hendricks, part of the one of them. And the job of, if you don't know exactly what uh, the college board is, they are 
ladies heading off to college or in between college that want to work, and they would do two fashion shows a day during the season and try to help uh, young ladies heading off to college put a wardrobe together. So that was fun. Um, as, as we uh, went on, Mother always loved to do fashion shows. This was at the Ocean Forest Hotel. Angela LaBruce, Helen Osteen, Angela again, and Frida Austin in this <coughs> collage of pictures there uh, with fashions from Helen Mates. We also did fashion, well, Ocean Forest, Pine Lakes Country Club. I see Becky Jennings in this, Darlene. Um, Becky and Mother were good friends, as were all these ladies, and uh, Becky was a great model for Mother. Uh, Officer's Wives Club with Mother in her chinchilla hat. <laughs> yep. And so she was happy to do these fashion shows. She never charged for any of this. Uh, and the officers' wives and most of her fashion shows were very well attended and uh, anticipated. People were always looked forward to that. Now, Mother had an, a great sense of style. I think that's one reason that she was appointed to this very, these various things. So I want to talk a little bit now about her personal um, style and her personal wardrobe, a few pieces I have brought. And she always believed that less is more. And she stuck with the basic colors, just like what, this is one of her outfits that I'm wearing today. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very heavy, <laughs> it weighs a ton, but it's all good. Um, but she was, it basic black, white, gray, camel, and beige were always a staple, and she would rework it. But she also had a great wardrobe for dressy occasions, uh, and we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, but anyhow, this is, y'all probably saw it in the slide. She would put her mink stole on backwards and put this gorgeous rhinestone pen in the middle of it. And that's how she would wear it. And this is just one of her outfits that I have, this beautiful dress with the sequined sheer bodice and, um, and many, other, uh, many other clothing and fashion uh, accessories that I, that I have. Fashion is fun, but more importantly, our parents were both big-hearted, always championing the underdog and young people. Other than the college board, which I've already mentioned, Mother often spoke at events for young people, such as Girls' State. Um, do we have a slide about Girls' State, Russ? Oh, okay. Um, and in, in doing all her travels for the business, Mother, through her uh, all her trips to New York City met lots of fascinating people, one being Danny Thomas. And his vision, who entered, and he's the one who introduced Mother to his vision of St. Jude. In the day, it was called ALSAC, Aiding Leukemia Stricken American Children. Through that and their work raising money, it became uh, St. Jude. She was actually on his, uh, she was involved from the beginning and was appointed the original National Gifts Committee co-chair as, as well as the local city director here in Myrtle Beach. She spent much of the early 60s fundraising for, for that hospital, uh, which was named St. Jude is the patron saint of the hopeless. She organized two fundraisers in Myrtle Beach, uh, one in May of 61 with Paul Michaels, who flew in and did a beautiful job. And the following year, it was Johnny Desmond 
And here's a photo of the original uh, <coughs> ticket for $12.50. <laughs> and there's mother with Johnny Desmond and our grandparents, Myron Fricori and Sophie Fricori. I'm sorry, it was at this? Our grandparents. Oh, sorry, our grandparents. <laughs> um, I have to mention a couple of people. Uh, some of the local doctors you all might remember who served as honorary committee members included Dr. Donald Dirk, Fred Nigels, Dr. Uh, W.M. Ragsdale, Holmes B. Springs, and some of the patrons included local families such as the Foresters, the Herrings, Gabe Joseph, and Anthony Thompson families. Generations of seriously ill children have benefit, benefited for decades from donations and fundraisers such as this and still continue to today just in a more modern way with social media. And, you know, birthday, you, people do that for fundraising for St. Jude as a birthday gift and, and it's just great to see. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about my early Myrtle Beach remembrances <clears throat> and some of the first memories I have is actually here at Chapin Library from the days of the Maypole dances back in the day. Um, sock hops were probably in this room. There was a basement and we would have sock hops after football games um, and that was great fun. Uh, also, the beach, <laughs> oh, in fact, I started at a very early age being a beach bum right there. <laughs> and that was my eighth birthday, I believe, and that's myself and some friends as cheerleaders. Once a Seahawk, always a Seahawk, right, folks? You better believe it. So I have a funny story to tell you. <laughs> uh, Judge and Ms. Epps don't know this story or didn't before they died. Bless them, they were sweet people. But Lynn Epps and I were great friends. And we used to spend the night together all the time. And so I was spending the night, Mikey, I think you were there this night, Susu. <laughs> And we decided, we had gotten an invitation to go to Surfside for a party, but we didn't have a car uh, yet. So we got the idea, I'm not gonna mention names, who came up with the plot, but we snuck out of Lynn's bedroom window, and it wasn't like stepping out onto the ground, it was, Jump, kind of jumped out, okay. <laughs> and I was the designated driver. And we pushed Judge Epps' car halfway down Poinsett <laughs> till we didn't think they could hear us crank it up. <laughs> and then everybody got in and we headed to Surfside. And we had a nice time in Surfside <laughs> until we had to come home before anybody woke up and we didn't want to wake anybody up. So we decided we would start home. Now this time I think Susie was driving or you might be, but we sort of went off the road. I mean, just enough that we were tilting. And so we hop out and thank goodness some guys come along and go, it looks like you might need some help here. Well. Thank you, yes. So they were able to push us out on the road and we continued on, stopped the car at the beginning of Poinsett, pushed it up and, and steered, whoever was driving, steered it into the driveway. We turned it, oh, we had turned it off up here. Turned it off, we get out, gently close the doors, get back in, through the window in Lynn's bedroom, and that was that. Was that. So, <laughs> we made it, I mean, we made it, right? 
is there anything for a party or something? I don't know. We, I mean, we were all driving, but we were still in high school. Uh, that curfew was blown. Uh, so they didn't wake up? No. <laughs> no. Uh, Claude and Jakey Epps were sound asleep. I think Russ would agree with me, as would our brother Walt, who couldn't be here today, and our sister Beth, who we lost in 2009, and miss every single day, that we were blessed. Mm -hmm. to be here, grow up in the golden era of Myrtle Beach, where everybody, and I'm blessed also to have friends from way back in the day that are still great friends today. And it's a precious thing. Growing up in, growing up in Myrtle Beach during the 50s and 60s, and we're very proud that our parents played a pivotal role in this special time in Myrtle Beach's history. Our parents' legacy lives on by instilling in us the values of integrity, generosity, gratitude, love of family, and of course, a sense of humor. Thank you very much. I know there'll be people who want to ask some questions, but when Russ said, um, forgive us because we're bragging about our parents, you have every right to brag. It's an incredible legacy, an incredible story. Don't you all agree? And you guys did a great job. And yes, we will take questions. Larry. Well, when, when Russ said that, it, it triggered something that I have said for decades. It came from Dizzy Dean, a very famous baseball announcer. And he always said, it ain't bragging if you've done it. Ah. Yes, sir. And they did it. They did it. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about the uh, fashion pieces and the traditional pieces that were sold in Helen's store. Yes. Where were they produced or manufactured or created? Oh, uh, thank you. All in the United States. Um, she would go to New York, um, and she and my father would go to New York oftentimes because Daddy pretty much uh, bought the shoes, and but Mother was pretty much uh, buying the fashion. And back in those days, guys, the sales reps for some of these companies traveled. We would host them in our home. There were some that became favorites. And they were characters. Ours. And they were, I mean, we right. just, A lot of them were characters, but fun. You know? And fun. It was just great. I uh, stand in memory Epstein. I mean, I could name, still name a few of those people. And she would work with them either, uh, either in the store or they would come in with their things into, that, into our house. And she would buy that way as well. Were they designed specifically for her? Um, some things, some things, uh, some special things she would have made for her. Um, but she carried lines like Lillian, uh, Roxanne bathing suits, uh, Villager, Capizio shoes. Um, uh, yeah. Weegins, Weegins, because part of, part of my growing up days, not only on the beach, but, uh, you know, we had to hit the beach club, we had to hit pad, the pad, and all up and down, <laughs> yeah, you know, all up and down, we would uh, hang out, you say, or dance. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Randy Jennings, my dear friend that we just lost not too long ago. We were at the pad one day, one afternoon, and he goes, Carolyn, because we used to, uh, Darlene just gave me a picture of us dancing a while ago, but we were at the pad, and he goes, Carolyn, let me teach you a
the drop belly roll. And I said, Randy, I don't know. I'm bigger than you. He said, no, come on. I said, well, don't drop me. Because you, the way that dance goes, you're hanging on to your partner, but your feet go back so that you're flat backed, and then you kind of drop, and that person's got to be able to pick you back up, right? So <laughs> I can't help but tell that story, darling. <laughs> um, so all our friends just had a great time. We had, I loved cheerleading for our Seahawks, and um, it was just a magical time in Myrtle Beach. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. I saw another hand. I, I worked with Beth in the summer of 65 and 66. Oh, great. At Helen Lake. Oh, oh awesome. wow. Uh, your mother was in and out a little, but not much. Yeah. <laughs> your father was a terrific father. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One day, one week in, or one day, when my mother was out of town, I, went, I called in sick and went to the beach. <laughs> you know, the next day, and your father never opened his mouth. <laughs> I kept thinking, just say something. I know. <laughs> he, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have. Yeah, he, that would not have been him. Well, I, I have a funny story about skipping school. I know I'm totally off subject. Um, I, some friends and I decided to skip school in, during high school, and we found one of the homes up along uh, the boulevard in the Ocean Forest section. Nobody was home, so we took our beach stuff out, laid out in their backyard, <laughs> until I started getting itchy, and I said, I've got to, I've got to go home. I wasn't feeling well. Darn if I didn't break out with the measles. <laughs> yeah. So my parents were not real happy. I, I can't, I'm not a doctor. I don't think a sunburn would bring out the measles. Well, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, uh, I was miserable for a week or two. Uh, show everyone. Carolyn, I want you to just open your coat if you would and show your jewelry oh. and, and the entire ensemble because it's beautiful. Yeah. This jewelry also belonged to Helen. Yes. Uh, not only the necklace, but the ring. You can do the, uh, you know, the Vanna White sort of thing, you know, or the, let's make a deal. Or Yeah, that's right. I mean, because this outfit is just beautiful, but the jewelry, too, belonged to Helen. I know. Who's the designer? And so beautiful. Uh, you, you, you need to walk down this runway, right? Uh, yeah, the, the runway, Carolyn. Trance. Prance like a fashion show, like your mom did for, for so many wonderful charities in the community. Look at her. Russ, we're creating a monster. Yeah, I know. She's never going to be the same. This was uh, Carolyn's payday here. But no, all the ensembles. Well, I can't get over the little waist. This is something I never had. How about most of you ladies? And that is like incredible, isn't it? No, they wore girdles. They didn't, wore girdles. Didn't they? I would have to wear four. But either way, yes, dear. Yes. Thank you so much. No, go ahead. And they said, you know, do you have anything, you know, from the store? Um, I kept lots of jewelry in the store. Um, Helen was such a fascinating mother. Uh, my mother had beautiful clothes that Helen was you know, maybe arranged for her to have or, or whatever. But having said that, my granddaughter, which means my mother's great granddaughter, will be graduating from Pratt this year, and she is wearing one of the dresses. Oh, wow. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. Wow. That's great, girls. Incredible. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Dude. I'm going to take it off in a minute. That's yeah. great. Yes. Did your parents do anything after they closed the store? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, the store closed for a variety of reasons. One was my mother became very ill, almost passed away. My parents divorced. And, um, but they both, my dad pretty much stayed in the field. He became 
the general manager of John Baldwin when they opened in Rainbow Harbor. And he was there for years. Then he opened when the designer jeans in the late 70s came along. He opened a what he called the Slack Shack right across that little corner across from City Hall. And our mother went into, she did a complete 180 from these years, and she went into um, inspirational Christian books. And so she was what they called a rack jobber, which means that she had uh, two employees, two trucks, and they would, she had all the um, Kmart uh, accounts east of the Mississippi for the uh, inspirational Christian books. Any other questions? Yes. The four children. How do, was that balance? Both mom and dad, the store, four kids, keeping track of what's going on. Was That's it balanced? A, How does that work? <laughs> well, Carolyn and I have always said there's there's this story for public <laughs> consumption. <laughs> And then there's another story yes. for semi-public. We might have a paid second <laughs> story. But no, in all seriousness, um, we had a lot of help. Uh, first of all, I'm 12 years, 12 years older than Russ. Um, we always had help in the house. Plus, our grandparents lived right around. We were on Marion Circle. And they were on Sumter Ave, so within walking distance for sure. Yeah, they retired from the Two Minute Grill about 1960, 61. So our grandmother was very instrumental in helping out mm -hmm. when. And my mom, I mean, she, it was unusual for those years. I mean, she did travel a lot, um, she was gone a lot. Um, our dad, um, you know, between my grandmother and my dad, um, it's not like my mom wasn't ever home, but um, she was never a morning person. So I never got well. I had to make sure I was up for school and got my breakfast <laughs> and everything. So it was a, you know, I mean, those that know our family, there, there are some interesting stories. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, we had, a, we kind of had an unusual. Um, like Carolyn said, are we going to tell the story about <laughs> waking? My dad used to tell the story about all the cocktail parties they would have. And who did he bump into in the middle of Oh, Sandy Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Go yeah. at 3 o'clock in the morning. So there were, there were parties. And then my mother, um, yeah. when she became a born-again Christian, she loved young people. So she, the next thing I know, it went from cocktail parties to like two years later, I'd get up in the morning and there would be young, I mean, this is a different time, 1971, 72, there would be sleeping bags of people <laughs> in the living room and they were young people, she would meet young people, they'd go to the pavilion, they'd minister to the youth, and the, the Jesus movement back then, you remember Godspell, Jesus Christ Superstar. So young people were really, at that time, really receptive to the, to the message. And so then they'd say, oh, you can come. You know, they'd say, we don't have anywhere to go or stay. I mean, I mean that would never happen now. But, but so it was, yeah, my mom was quite an interesting person. <laughs> Yeah. I was curious when you were saying that uh, the little window box or shadow box was still intact. Mm -hmm. and is the building open? Uh, is the building's not open, but if you um, know where on Main Street, you can, because the, the city owns it now and it's all papered over, but you will see that shadow box mm -hmm. and you will see on the ground the flagstone that they picked out, which we also had at our home in, in Marion Circle. We had a flagstone patio. It's still there. We couldn't believe it. And the, the little display case is there and behind it the redwood paneling. Now I think they've painted the redwood paneling, but all that's still there. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? Anybody else? Well, I think they deserve a huge <laughs> round. Thank you. Thank you.
Carolyn lives in Mount Pleasant, and Russ lives in Burbank, California. So they made a big effort to not only travel here, uh, but to bring us the joy of the past uh, through Helen Mates and Daddy Mates. Yeah. I never heard his first name. Walter. Walter Mates. That's our brother's name, too. Oh, all right. And so there you go. You know the work that they put into this video presentation and to bring this message to us today. One more round of applause for the Mates family.